Well, it is definitely good to be with you this evening. Um, it, I did marry a Michigan girl, but I'm not sure if I could do Michigan winters as yet. I do enjoy the fall. This is beautiful. The fall is wow. I have enjoyed the fall, but I heard the snow is coming. So I think I need to get back to the Bahamas. So, so do pray for us. Um, we, uh, our church over there, we have been kind of in lockdown for a number of weeks. We just went back into to real live person-to-person -person service about three weeks now. So I do need to send my thank you to the to the pastor here, to the staff, um, Pastor Ryan, um, Jonathan there, who's helped me communicate to my people through um, through video. So they've been recording my messages so that my people can hear me. Now all of a sudden they know I'm not there. Because, because now they're in person, like, where's Pastor Cranston? Oh, he hasn't been here for a few weeks. So, so good to be able to get back there. But um, tr trust you have your Bibles with you. I hope you have your Bibles with you. We are in Isaiah chapter 64 this evening. Isaiah chapter 64. Thank you for being um, the home church away from home. Susanna, my wife, and I have appreciated being here, learning from you, learning from your pastor, and just feeling the passion for God. God is doing the work here. I've said that um, to my wife whenever, almost whenever we leave, like God is doing a work here. It is exciting to see what God is doing. And especially during these, these kinds of times as pastors, we want to know what is God saying? What is God saying for our people for this time? That's a big thing. And we're, we're looking at all the things that are happening in the world. Lord, what is it? And it's really been um, enjoyable for me to hear the burden from your, from your pastor. And I'm actually going to um, ride that burden a little bit tonight, just hearing his passion that is so obvious um this evening i want to look at um, a topic that i've called the plea for the presence of god we've heard a lot from your pastor about um, the consuming fire actually every time i sit in your auditorium and i look up i see around me believe god or i believe god and it it's such a wonderful reminder but the caution many times that we have in the church as as people of god is we want god but we almost have a preconceived idea of how he's supposed to show up we want him to come in a certain way and that's how we want God. Oh, Lord, we want you, but we want you like this. And to do this, because we know you're going to do this, because this is what I think you should do. Well, tonight, I just want us to, to kind of just stop and look back. And we're, we're going to jump in the, in the passage here um, in Isaiah chapter 64. Actually, that's going to be one of our jump off points. But... The, uh, the, the question I do have, and this is a question I have for me as well. Um, I do not know how much uh, Pastor J.D. even knows of my, my past or, or my journey in, in pastoring, but I grew up in the church that I now pastor in the Bahamas. I, I, my, the church has been there for 43 years, I believe. So, so it's the only church I know. So I grew up in the church. My pastor was a wonderful pastor. I mean, he was one of those whose shoes it's hard to fill. You know, when I came in, we're like, I need to do what? And, and but one of the things of, that I learned from my pastor, he, he was a pastor, but he was an evangelist before he became a pastor. And he traveled throughout the Bahama Islands. And, and we've heard these stories. He was one that God used in a mighty, mighty way. And he would tell us of what happened in a little place called Spanish Wells in one of our islands in the Bahamas. 
And I, would, I actually love to hear him tell this story. And when my, my father-in-law was even in the Bahamas, before he was my father-in-law, when he was there, I had to get him to Pastor Allen to help Pastor Allen tell him this story. They were in Spanish wells, and they had a week of meetings to preach, and they were evangelists. But there was a little old lady who was praying for the move of God for years. And she was in that church, and she would pray, and she would pray. Well, that week, everything went wrong as could go wrong. Even Pastor Allen's voice, well, he was evangelist at the time, his voice and everything went wrong. And he talked about the day God showed up. And the presence of the Lord came in that place, and he spoke spoke of how the move of God happened in that church that spread through that community. There were people in the fishing boat. It was a little fishing community. They were out fishing on the water and they had to come in and get to the altar and get right with God. We had kids walking on the streets who didn't even have anything to do with church, turn around, come back, and get right with God. There were people on the road. It was as though God showed up. And uh, even Leonard Ravenel, if you know his name, he came down to actually do a study of what is happening in Spanish Wells. Well, I'm telling you, as a, as, a, as a young guy coming after a Pastor Allen, I am going, Lord, we need you to show up. But what if he did? That's the question this evening. What if he showed up here? What if he showed up in this church? What if he showed up in this community or in this state? What if God himself showed up? Because we cannot dictate the end results of what God will do when he shows up because he is God. But what if God were to show up? And are we even desirous for God to show up. And so this, this, e this evening, I'm going to do something I, I teach and I tell my, those who I teach never do, never um, do an illustration for the first time in front of the people. Always practice it beforehand, but, I, but based upon physics, it should work. Okay. All right. Okay. So, so here we have... Um, these are just regular sponges here. These are just regular sponges. And many times our, our actions with God's presence is, Lord, I want you to show up, but just pray me. Whew, yeah. <laughs> we got God. <laughs> yeah, amen, amen. That's enough now. <laughs> That's enough. We, we, we've had enough, okay? Just, just enough to get the edges off. You know, and sometimes, and, and we, we watch and we, we, we're not asleep. We know a lot of what goes on in Christendom today. And a lot of it is the, oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> you know, now, now, that's enough, Lord. That's about as far as you could go. I, I, don't, I don't need more than that. Okay? But then, there are those of us who I, I pray... Oh, we love to get soaked. Oh, Lord, soak me. I love, and, and I feel as though we come to church to get soaked. And be like, oh, we got soaked today. We have, we're now good for a week. <laughs> you know, and then we come back next week dry. <laughs> because we need to get, oh, we need soaking again. But there is Duncan Campbell, um, a, a revivalist, had that concept of revival. He says, revival is a community that is saturated with God. You know what our prayer should be? Lord, don't soak me. Saturate me. Saturate me, Lord. 
What would happen if God were to saturate this place? Where it's, because when you soak, it's still a lot of you. But when it gets a saturation, it's much more of him. It's almost overflowing to the point that it can't help but change other people in the process. We want a saturation of God. This is where we ought to be. But we have, I believe, many times just gone with the spray. Or even the soak and we think we're good because we compare our people who have the spray. But when we look around, who got the soak? I mean, who got the float? <laughs> who got the saturation? And may we have a desire for God to show up. But if he did, what would that mean? Because I think, for me, going through this season, especially even with my church, I remember Easter. I will, Easter was such a, a hard thing because for us, Easter is a big deal. This is a church. This is church day, and, and nobody went to church in the Bahamas. You had to stay home. And I remember there was a. What's his name? Andre Bocelli, I think that's his name. He did a, a, a opera singer, did a concert in Italy. He ended it with Amazing Grace. And he did it a cappella on Easter Sunday. And when they showed it, they showed all of the cities of the world live. And the streets were empty on Easter Sunday. I remember they showed um, New York City, then they showed Paris, then they showed um, in Italy, and they went to all of these places, and the streets were empty on this Easter Sunday. I'm like, Lord, this is Easter. What are you saying, Lord? Well, if, there was, if we are blind and deaf, we should be able to hear that God is saying that he could stop the world if he needs to. He is still God. There were world leaders not knowing what to do. There were the experts who called him names. They still didn't know what to do but it didn't take the throne away from my God. He was still on the throne. And so here we are now, during this season of time, going, Lord, if anyone should get it, the people of God, we need to get it. We can't let this season pass and we not get it. And what is it? We need you, Lord. Sometimes we want the things God brings us. But I think we need to get to the point of saying, Lord, we just want you. Amen. We need to get to the point of looking. Now, I, this country, there's a lot of decisions happening in the next few weeks for you. God's people need to be talking to him. But I can tell you, one of the things that we as believers could mistake is the, the blessings of God for the presence of God. Lord, may we have your presence and may that bring your blessing. Not Lord, we want you because we need the blessing. We need to, to have these kinds of freedoms. Lord, we need these kinds of things, so we need you. Stop it. Lord, we need you. Full stop. Full stop, Lord. We need you. Let's look at Isaiah. I love Isaiah because Isaiah had this, the picture of God from the beginning in, in um, Isaiah, the 6 and 7. But in 64, the text is, Oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens, that thou wouldst, wouldst come down, that the mountains may flow down at thy presence. Let's pray. Father, we ask 
for the presence of our God, our Lord, our Father. Lord, we've heard many stories of the past. We cannot stand on those. Lord, we need your presence for this time, for this moment, for where we are in history right now. Lord, we need you, not just your blessings. We need our God to show up. May your people have a heart to plead for the presence of their God. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look at this, the plea. Because he says in verse 1, Oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens, and thou wouldst come down. Looking at this plea, I'll tell you there is, there's a reason he's giving this plea. There's a, there's a reason. It's because he had a question. May we get so comfortable with the saturation of God that when it's gone, we can't operate. I'll tell you, one of the things as a pastor, and if I could be transparent as my people may be watching, oh boy, one of the things as pastor, I can tell you that I have had to come to the realization with a few years ago was going through the motions as church. Where we can have church without God. When we can have a good service, but the Holy Spirit not be present. We can have beautiful everything, but so the Lord actually took, took me through, through a, a period of time, we, we, we called it the Sabbath, where we actually, I took the church through a Sabbath and I, we, we cut down everything. We cut down the choirs and the specials and the music and the, everything. And I said, everyone will just listen and all we'll do is sing hymns and give the word. We're not coming to perform yet because, and I said it because I felt as though we were just performing without the presence of the Lord. Can we have church without God? Well, may we get so used to God's presence that when he, when he doesn't show up on a Sunday morning, everybody goes crazy. Like, what, what are we going to do now? How, how can we operate? You know, it's like if the pastor doesn't show up, everyone goes, so what are we, what, what we going to do now? May, may when the Lord, if he doesn't show up on a Sunday morning, like, we have to shut down. We have to get on our knees. We, this is what was happening. Let's look at, um, he says, verse 15 of chapter 63. He says, look down from heaven and behold thy habitation of thy holiness and of thy glory. Where is thy zeal and thy strength, the sounding of thy bowels and of thy mercies toward me? Are they restrained? This was where we get to verse 1. Verse 1 of chapter 64 is actually connected to chapter 63. And this is where it starts. He said, Lord, look down from heaven. Then he goes, Lord, where's your zeal and your strength? Lord, where are your bowels of mercies? Where is your love towards me? Lord, where, where are you? So he had a question that brought him to this plea. Lord, where are you? And I think we need to step back here in the West, in our country. We, I, I feel for the church of our land. Lord, we need to get the people of God back where they need to be. Where are the people of God right now in America? Where are they? Are we even burdened for, for God? Where's the questioning? Lord, where's your zeal and your strength? Lord, we want to see your power displayed. And then he goes on. So there's the, the, the because of a question, but it's based upon a relationship. He says, verse 16, Doubtless thou art our father. Through Abraham, the, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not. Hey, Abraham may not know us. Israel don't know us. We're far beyond that. But Lord, you are our father. 
So that's the basis of a relationship. So we're speaking to Christians, believers, people who are supposed to know God. Now, because you're supposed to know God doesn't mean that you know Him. But these are people who are supposed to know Him. You're our Father. We should know your presence. We should know your loving kindness. And then he goes, it says, based upon a need. Verse 17, O Lord, thou hast, why hast thou made us err from thy ways and harden our hearts from thy fear? It's interesting the way he, he says this. In other words, actually what he is saying is, Lord, we miss you by you not being here. Lord, by me not sensing your presence, I feel as though I'm in the wrong, I'm doing wrong, I keep tripping up, I can't do anything right. Lord, we need you. Boy, for God's people to get to that place when we recognize, and this is the reason the call for the plea. They recognize, Lord, we're tripping up. Lord, we're messing up. Lord, we're not doing it right. Something is wrong. We need you again, Lord, to show up. We need to be, to get ourselves in the place we need to be before we can start looking at, well, let's point our finger at so-and-so ain't doing right. God's saying, what about my people? Where are my people? So this is the plea out of a need. But then verse 18 it says, the enemy is busy, Lord. The people of thy holiness have possessed it, but a little while, but a little while, our adversaries have trodden down thy sanctuary. The enemy is out, Lord. Lord, the enemy wants to destroy your name. Lord, the enemy wants to destroy the things that are good and godly and right and holy. The enemy is rampant, Lord. We need you to show up. There are reasons we should be asking for the presence of God. But sometimes we take it so flippantly. And why would God then show up if his people are not serious? And then it goes to verse 1. Oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens. So we have the plea, but we have to get to the person. Because when we start saying, who is it that we want to show up? My, when I was a teenager, my, my, my father was, is, was, is a police officer. He's retired now, but he goes to the police station every single day. As a retired police officer he just it's in the blood it's in the blood and so when I was a teenager my my um, friends would kind of encourage to do foolishness I won't say what kind of foolishness I was a good boy I was a good teenager boy you know but but they would encourage hey man this is what they say man your daddy cool, man. Your daddy cool. We could go. We could do. We could stay out. And I would say, my daddy ain't cool. My daddy ain't cool. I know my daddy. Daddy ain't cool. <laughs> I don't know who they thought my daddy was. But I lived with him. I knew him. He could put on a face for my friends. But when my friends left, oh, the real daddy came out. Go wash those dishes, boy. <laughs> you know? So my father, in my estimation, was a person who had rules and standards. And if I did X, Y, and Z, my friends may have thought, oh, your daddy cool. I knew who he was. Amen. My actions ought to reflect my knowledge of my father when you know God my mom used to say this all the time and I my wife now can attest to this my mom still says it that person does not know God she would just be dry <laughs> that person does not know God I'm like mom you don't know that how can you you know you don't even know them 
And the point that she's making is if you knew God, there's no way you would do that because you know what that would do to your God. You don't know God. And that's, that's where she was. And so the question is, when we talk about the God who we want to show up, let's make sure we know who he is. Let's look, at, can we look at Isaiah 57 for me? Just Isaiah 57, 15, one of my favorite passages. I call this the God who brings revival. We pray for revival. And when God, when God works, God usually in scripture describes himself in a way that brings about the certain characters. So when you read scriptures, he usually introduces himself. Let me say it like that. He would say, for thus saith the Lord of hosts. When he says that, he means the God of the armies is on display here. For thus saith the Lord who, who has tender mercies toward Israel, whatever. So whatever it is he's connecting to his name is the character he's bringing to the situation. So you always have to see what he's connecting. And so this is the God of revival. He says, for thus saith the high and lofty one, who inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. Who is this that rings revival? First of all, for thus saith the high. The word high here is we are not on the same level of. He is transcendent. When we deal with the God who brings revival, you see what we have done in the West, in our Christian culture, is we've brought, brought God down. We've cheapened God. We've made him user-friendly. We wanted the cool God so we could get the young people. We wanted that kind of God. So we brought him down and God says, wait now. When I show up, I am the transcendent God. I am not on the same level with man. I am the transcendent God. And so no matter how much we can, hey, hey, hey. Does he love us? Yes. Is he our father? Yes. But don't forget his position. He is God. Because sometimes we play around, and I say this to my, when I was a youth pastor many, many years ago, I say this to my teenagers, sometimes we are flippant when we play around with God. God is not like your parents, God is not even like your pastor, because we make mistakes. You treat God like he's God. So there are certain times we don't play around. See, we need the transcendent God back again. Because we have a lot of people making fun of our God. Because we have cheapened him. He is transcendent. But thus saith the high and lofty one. And I love it in scriptures because these are similar words, but they're different. High means not on the same level. Lofty means he has the right to rule. He is sovereign. So he says, I am not only on the position, I have the rights associated with it. See, we, we come from the British culture, from the British history and heritage. We have the governor general who represents the queen in our land. And in England, the queen has a position, but she has no power. So. Here she may be the high seat, but she does not have the right to rule. But see, when it comes to God, he has the seat and the right to rule. And we have to remember that. Because when we come as people, because when we start talking about saturated with God, when we get there, we have to understand what we are saying 
Lord, I want the sovereign God to saturate, which simply means, Lord, I give up my rights. You have the right to rule in every and any situation as you see fit. And I will submit. Because you are sovereign. See, when God shows up, see, this is the reason we are not so serious about God showing up because we want him to show up on our terms. But when he begins showing up on his terms, what if his way is not the plan that we have? Then we go, sovereign God, I just want you, not just your plan. I want you. See, this is where we have to get as people of God. If we are going to be serious about God doing a work in our land and in our churches. Because God may have to do a work that we do not like. And we need to be the people that he can use. For thus saith the high and lofty one who inhabiteth eternity. Inhabited, he inhabit. Uh, isn't that a beautiful phrase? God inhabits eternity. He's not living in this moment. He's not surprised by tomorrow, next year, or the month of November. God lives in eternity past and eternity future. And he sees it all and he makes decisions for me now based upon his perspective. See, this is the God we come to. He inhabits eternity. And his name is holy. His name, name, when he actually connects his name to his holiness, it actually means this is my central attribute. It's like the spoke on a wheel. The spoke is his holiness and all of the other attributes are connected to his holiness and only make sense when viewed from the perspective of holiness. You cannot take love away from the holiness of God. God is love, God is love, but you have to look at it through his holiness. God is love, but because he is holy, he had to send his son to die and pay the price because of his love. See, God's love has to be seen through his holiness. Every attribute has. So he says, my name is holy. See, this is where we struggle because we want a God whose name is compromise. Lord, your name is understanding. Lord, your name is, okay, I, 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 I'll let you go this time. See, his name is holy. And he dwells in a high and holy place. See, the only way we can understand that is when we get even to that tabernacle. And understanding the tabernacle, we know that God, when you go into that holy place, have you ever thought of stepping into the holy of holies? when the, the curtain, the veil falls behind you and in front of you is a wall of gold. On the side of you is a wall of gold. And the only thing in front of you right here is the Ark of the Covenant with the angels' wings pointed towards each other. And the only light in this room is the Shekinah glory of God. And he says, I am holy. You don't need anyone. I don't need anyone. I am holy. We understood it when they built the temple. And when they built that temple and Solomon prayed, and after his prayer, the Bible says, smoke came down and filled the holy place. The presence of God. 
We understand it from Isaiah because Isaiah starts illustrating when he starts saying, Oh, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. And they talked about the seraphim saying, Holy, holy, holy. When God comes down, he brings his holiness with him. And that's what we have to see. Because that's what this passage is about in Isaiah 64. He says he brings his holiness with him. And when he comes down, Isaiah talks about the mountain shaking and melting. And then he gives the passage I mean, I can't read the whole context. You have to go home and read it. But jump down and see um, verse 6. When he really gets it, he says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Lord, when you show up, you show us two things God has to deal with when he shows up. Sin and self. Two things God has to deal with because of his holiness. Sin. That's why he says, my righteousness. Because Lord, when you show up, I see, Lord, where I really am. I used to say, actually, I still say it because I'm saying it now. Um, when I worked for the Bill Rice Ranch, I was in charge of trash crew. And we would take up all the trash as we, we go through, um, through camp. And sometimes I wanted to catch the service after I picked up the trash. You know, because we're on trash run. We're missing a good service, good preaching. So I'd run in the back. But sometimes you still stink, you know. So I would run to the room and put on cologne. And then go back to the service. Does that work? Have you ever put cologne on top of trash juice? It doesn't work. My, my point being, sometimes when we do our good works over our sin, it's disgusting to God. It stinks. It does not glorify Him. And this is where we as God's people during this season need to pause and reflect. Because we are good at doing good works. But God is good at seeing what goes be on behind it. And so we need to, if we want the presence of God, if we want God to move in our land, if we want God to show up, we need to be ready for God. And God says, this is what the Isaiah said, my righteousness is as filthy rags. My sin has taken me away, just like a leaf that's blown away. But we didn't finish Isaiah 57. And the two passages we will end with tonight are so beautiful. He says, Isaiah 57, 50, For thus saith the high and lofty one, who inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him. Who is he dwelling with? If you read that passage, he's with him who is of a contrite heart, a contrite spirit. And he gives us the purpose to revive the spirit of the contrite ones. See, when God shows up, he starts breaking, he starts burning, he starts destroying the things that need to be destroyed that do not matter for eternity. He starts getting us ready to where we need to be because the presence of the Lord is there. And the only way he will stay is if we are broken 
and contrite. Because the Bible says he is with him who is of a broken and a contrite heart. Because what God does is he starts crushing our pride, crushing ourselves and pulling away our sin, showing us our need so that we can say, Lord, I want you more than this. I will let it go to receive you. He will not stay if you're holding on. But look at Isaiah and the place we have to end is verse 8. But now, Isaiah 64, verse 8. But now, O Lord, thou art our father, and we are the clay. And thou art our potter, and we are the work of thy hand. This is the response. If God shows up, what should the response be? The response should be relationship. Lord, you're my father. I have no place else to go. And then two, second response is the clay. Lord, do whatever to me as you would with clay to make me into what you need for this moment. Are we willing to have God show up? Church, we need God. We need God. We don't need a good government. We don't need a society of freedom. You know what we need first and foremost? God. And if he brings the rest, it's icing on the cake. May God's people plead for God's presence once again. Father. May we have a heart for our God. Not just the things he brings to us. Not just for the good times and the good seasons. But for him. And for whatever that means. Lord, we need you. We need you to show up. Saturate your people once again. So we can reflect the God who loves us. That's what we want. We pray it in Jesus' name.